fucking nerds. Who wants a shot at the champ? They bring the heat. Francis Ngannou is the hardest puncher in the history of fighting. They bring the knowledge. If you think this fight is going five rounds, you are out of your mind. They bring you the picks. The dog is getting it done in this one. We deliver every single week. We're bringing the heat, ladies and gentlemen. The money line. Don't miss it on the MMA Experts channel each week. The Money Line. We are live. It's a beautiful Monday, March 11th. Holy shit, March 11th. We're uh, heading into uh, springtime almost. I'm looking forward to it. We're talking UFC Vegas 88. And of course, we're recapping an absolute violent weekend, which was UFC 299. I'm AJ. There's my guy, Mike Finch. What's up, homie? Oh, man, were those fights great or what? I yes. mean, Poirier with the comeback dub. He was getting out wrestling a little bit. He was in some bad spots, but every time he let his hands go, he was landing. And then the main event, I mean, they don't make him more durable than Chito Vera. That shit was insane. Yeah. I think Miami had a lot of fun. Yeah, Miami enjoyed, and I enjoyed. And I think that uh, most people probably enjoyed 299. It was pretty lit. From top to bottom, obviously, we got to talk the main event of the evening to start the show off. Sean O'Malley defends the title. It was Mike Finch's lock. Give the man some credit. Uh, he believed in O'Malley through and through. Obviously, we both were on Team Sugar Show. O'Malley's boxing is smooth. His footwork is incredible. His knee up the center broke Cheeto's face. But it just comes down to how tough Cheeto Vera is to be able to deal with a tremendous amount of damage and still at the end of the fight swinging for the fences. So adamant performance, gutsy performance. Sean O'Malley is just that guy. He was significantly better. And I think O'Malley's on that superstardom track. Like, I don't know. As much as people want to say he's got no charisma, yada, yada, he's still got a sick fighting style, and he's got a cool flow. Sugar Sean O'Malley's not doing well with the fans. Uh, Chito Vera is a total Chad right now. Wasn't that AJ last week? Did I not watch that video? I was talking AJ? shit. I, I, press conference, he lost. He lost the press conference. You're flipping on us, bro. Don't fuck around. You're flipping on us. You were saying that the fans weren't about Sugar Sean O'Malley, true? I was saying that they were dissing him at the uh, the presser. Bro, not, and now they're going to be loving him because my man put on a performance. Look, he's faster than Chito Vera. He's lighter on his feet. He's got more weapons. It's just better, man. He's just better than Chito Vera all around. Um, I, I think that it was a very, very masterful, masterful performance. The one thing that really stood out to me was just the fact that Cheeto could weather all of that. I mean, I did expect him to land, but I figured Cheeto would crack earlier than that. That was very, very impressive. His speed was phenomenal, and he really just, as, as he got more and more comfortable, you know, Cheeto always starts slow. You can't let Sugar Sean get going and find your timing because he just started ripping him up. Performances like that, are going to just keep elevating his stardom. No, it wasn't a highlight reel knockout, but that knee he landed on Chito Vera's orbital bone, that's going to last in the highlight reel for a long time. I agree. Pick up MMA. Thank you for the two bucks. Smash that like button. Let's go. And I got to bring up this guy, all right? Because I think that we have somebody, I don't know, making race too much of a fucking thing. And I think it's a societal problem and I'm calling him out on it. Mr. Darius Hoosey talking all this shit. Give some picks, white boy. Listen, bro. The color of our skin and your skin has no fucking matter in the discussion of life and combat sports. So I had to bring him up, bro. He's talking all this shit up in here. And normally I don't bring up the haters, but I don't know. I feel like too many people let racist shit slide. So I'm not. Don't be fucking racist. Black, white, orange, green, blue, yellow. I don't give a fuck. You're an asshole and you're getting the fuck off the channel, bro. That's it. <laughs> you're out. Fuck you. Goodbye. Out, out. Yeah. Come on, man. Out. I'm not working for that. Give us some picks. No, I don't know no you racist shit, shit, son. Right. I don't know you a damn thing, son. Exactly. Come That's on. That's it. Fuck that. Hey, double A. Thank you for the 199, baby. Let's go. Big W. Big W. Thank Listen, you, double people. A. That's my favorite battery. Let's go. Listen, stand against racism no matter what side it's on, bro. Fuck that shit. I hate it. Facts, facts. Hey, UFC casual. Memory, just pouring in right hey, now. my guy, Darius is a bum. AJ, you the man. Keep up the good work, brother. Let's go, champ.
Let's go, champ. Big UFC w. casual would know a bum when he sees one. Right. He knows. He knows. He's got one on his fucking picture. He knows. He knows. He's got that booty right there. I never realized that's what his picture was. That's funny <laughs> as well. Oh, you my God. You didn't get my joke. You didn't get oh my, my joke. Oh, my God. Literally a Anthony picture of an, of an ass. That's hey, great. Antelope, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Look, he's got the he's got the the fencer. I like yeah. that, man. I always say, like when you're jabbing somebody, it's like fencing when you take that step, right? So he knows a little thing or two. Maybe he maybe he oh. trains some striking, some fencing. Yeah. I want to try it. I think this. So fair. they always do Star Wars for May fourth because like May the fourth be with you. I think yeah. at gym UFC Rosemead, we're gonna do like lightsaber fight day. I just feel like that would be sick, sick right? We got to yeah. take some lessons, get a pro in to teach us some fencing. Yeah, I think that you doing lightsaber fight day would be absolutely badass. Is everybody not going to have fun? Come on. Yeah, they're going to have a great time. I was actually funny. I was looking at a clip of uh, Star Wars yesterday. I'm like, man, I think I can go back and rewatch the saga, bro. It's been years for me, man. I think I got to throw it on. I got to give it some love. Oh, I'm constantly watching Star Wars because we're watching Clone Wars and Clone okay. Wars has about a thousand hours of content. They're like 33 <laughs> episodes a season. So many seasons. I'm in season three now. It is an incredible amount of content to watch, but I'm thoroughly entertained. I, I must say yeah. in my glasses today, I'm looking like more of a dork. I am a Star Wars fan. Listen, you know what, Finch? I think it's a stylish look, bro. I think it's a stylish look, bro. I appreciate that. Look, I was Alan this yeah. weekend, folks. I was at the Oscars. All right. I was on E Entertainment. I had open right here, maybe on YouTube and Instagram. I was just. I don't know if that's Mike Finch or a robot. Sometimes, Mike Finch, are you AI? You you're frozen on me, Mike Finch. I'm I'm frozen. I don't know. Yeah, you were, you were lagging out on I me. Mean, I thought you were an AI, dude. I'm like, is this guy a robot? All right. Hey, from Anna. MMA, thank you for the two. Mike Finch right now, he's going AI on us, dude. Am I back? Drop a dono for Iron Knee and Finch, man. Let's go. Beat it there is Alley Point VTV. No, Finch, you're not, you're not back, my brother. Oh, man. Work on this. I'm going to work on this. Mike Finch versus the, the internet. Data. Mike Finch is out right. of the internet. Figure it out over tackle difficulties. I talk about being holiday actors this week. Yeah, let, listen, bro. Listen, Mike Finch has got some technical difficulties. We'll give him a second. Right now, he's frozen in time. Hey, MMA clips. Thank you for becoming a member. Shout out to you, Big W, new member on the channel. Let's go, Finch. I think you might have to reset and rejoin. I got you fully lagged out right now. I can't hear you, I hear my brother. You hello, hello. You're not lagging at all. So I could stream. Damn, Finchman's locked out. We might have to reset him. The Finchman's frozen. The frozen Finch. We're gonna call him Mike Iceman Finch. Finch started talking about Star Wars and turned to C three PO. Isn't that crazy how that happened? He sounds just like him. C-3PO was with us, man. Finch frozen like Elsa. He is omnipolar. We'll get him back in a minute. We'll get him back in a minute. Thank you for the one month of membership, omnipolar. I appreciate the hell out of you. Sergio 88. Cheeto got paid to be a punching bag. Hey, listen, but he did get paid. I agree, though. He got touched up bad. He got dominated. I know we need more emojis. Pick him. I got to make it happen. I'm waiting for the comeback of the Finch. Finch is uh Finch has got some technical difficulties. He'll be back with us in a moment. AJ, we need some more emojis. I agree. I'm going on vacation, but after that, I got you. Cheeto is one tough son of the gun. AJ the goat with the locks. Let's go. AJ, you made me bank with MVP call. Let's go, useless. I appreciate that. Finch man is uh he's taking a moment. He's taking a moment to gather himself. You had some technical difficulties at the start of the stream. Your lock is Dolgarian. You'll hear my lock soon, too. W Dono, guys. Everyone matters. Fuck yeah. Fuck yeah. All right. All right. Here he is. He's back. Are we good? I hope Return so. Return of the Mac. Yeah. Return of the Mac. Once again. Let's go. Come on, Let's son. Go. 
All right, look, I'm trying, okay? I'm trying to hang out with you guys. What Wi-Fi you got? What type of Wi-Fi? Oh, I got that bullshit, bro. I need to switch to that Elon Musk Starlink, my I friend. I think that's the one. Spectrum. And we've had him out at the house, and, and yeah. I do my best. I'm hardwired, dude. This is yeah, it doesn't. I know I you are. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. I think I uh, it ain't even Wi-Fi. They I'm might have to give you a refund. <laughs> look sugar sean o'malley looked good uh yeah. that was a dominant performance but how about the fucking diamond the diamond looked good and so does from fresno as spider-man my guy we appreciate you dropping some heat thank, thank you for the dono dog let's go dustin poirier versus benoit santini it ended with poirier flatlining benoit santini you know benoit santini to be fair was doing good work in the grappling and he seemed to, I think, be on his way to winning the fight. And then the fatigue set in a little bit. And the striking is still a little iffy. A little? One thing that I noticed, all right, uh, significantly, Benoit yeah, does not move up. his head. He doesn't Poirier move his head. Did not miss him, dude. No. That was target practice. It was. Benoit's head movement doesn't exist. And he got flattened because of it. But his grappling is really good. Very strong, and he was imposing his will. But you know, you're gonna need to do more than just get like kind of a, a cross body ride and throw a couple shots. You're going to need to be able to really use a complete grappling game to control Dustin Poirier. And when Dustin Poirier would pop back up, you know, he just had nothing for him. Like when you have Dustin's back, switch to a body triangle. Why do these fighters not use the body triangle? You know, my friend Kevin always says, you know, having the back is the worst position in MMA. He says, stay in mount and fights like that make him look like he's right it's like they've got to control the back better they've got to be able to use a body triangle because if you don't these fighters are getting too good at escaping it's pretty damn hard to choke somebody and you take away most of your opportunities to strike when the person can roll when you're on their back so you know staying in mount really is seeming like the the the, the pick if you don't have a good back mount if you don't have a good body triangle on the feet it was a mismatch. I mean, I thought Dustin was a better striker. We talked about how Dustin was a better boxer and how he had an opportunity there. I didn't think it would be that wide. He just hit him with everything. I think target practice is the right phrase for it because every time he threw, he landed. He just had to crack him up a few times and stop going for guillotines, Dustin. Your coach is right. Mike Brown helped this man out because he can dominate these fights if he's not jumping all these guillotines. Yeah, I think that Dustin Poirier said after the fight, though, he's not going to give it up. He's fucking He's going to keep shooting guillotines. He's a comedian. He's a comedian. Yeah, he's, he's probably got a good guillotine, but you got the MMA gloves out there. You got a guy like that Frenchman who's got no back of his head. You just sliding off the damn thing. I don't know, man. He had good guillotine defense. We'll give him some props, but Poirier's boxing is very high level. He could do that to a lot of guys. I mean, straight boxing, he beats all these lightweights. Dustin Poirier's hands are still terrifying, and that southpaw stance is, is slick. I'm looking forward to seeing Dustin Poirier in his next fight. What's interesting, though, is he's calling for a title fight. I made an every fight to make following UFC 299 video. I called it Dana White make these fights to get his attention. You know what I'm saying? And I honestly think Dustin Poirier does not deserve a title fight. Like, I get it, timing's everything, but now we're penalizing the UFC 300 lightweights by fighting in massive matchups, and now Poirier, who just beat 13, is going to fight Islam. I know Islam's all in. Why is Islam so adamant to fight Dustin Poirier, and why is Ali all over it? You know why, Mike Finch? Because there is a clear-as-day path to victory. When Islam gets Poirier to the ground, he's not going to get back up, and he's going to get submitted. Yeah. Of course, but come on, give him the title shot. Like, let's still see it. You know, you want to see it. All right. I'm surprised that nobody's even talking about that. Have you heard anybody bring up Dustin Poirier title shot? No reporters asked Dana White at the post fight press conference. Nobody's really pushing for a Poirier title fight. It's like, how much longer do we get to see Prime Poirier? Now I'm feeling, you know, not so hating on Connor because I'm like, okay, Poirier's hands are really nice. Really nice. And Connor was hitting Poirier too. So it makes me feel like his title timing maybe wasn't so bad but uh we got to see poirier in some big fights just give him a crack at the title it's good for islam it's good for poirier the fans are gonna win yeah if islam gets on top of him it's probably a wrap but you know what poirier's still in that fight you know he could still crack islam he could still potentially shock the world 
bro, here's my argument against it, though. When you have the BMF belt between Gaethje and Holloway at 300, who Gaethje, you know, just beat Poirier fight before. Then you have Oliveira and Saruki and Oliveira just beat Poirier fight before. I think Poirier gets a title fight if this weird circumstance comes to fruition. If Max Holloway beats Justin Gaethje and then Arma and Saruki and is successful against Oliveira, then I think it would be more sensible to give Poirier the shot because of what he's done in the division. But if you have Oliveira win and you have Gaethje win, to say that Poirier is next and they do it in June, I don't know, then Islam's out for a while. I don't think June is the spot where Islam is going to be returning on. Because Dana White himself, I mean, they said that the Oliveira Sarukian fight is for the number one contender spot. I do think that Poirier versus Makachev is still a bigger fight than the rematch with Sarukian and Makachev. I don't know. I just think it's odd that he would jump the line like that after a recent loss by devastating knockout to Gaethje who's ahead of him and a loss to Oliveira in a title fight. It's just he's not the most deserving guy, but he does have the star power to end up getting a shot. Like Dustin Poirier is up there with UFC popular wow. fighters at this point. You know, I've been working in Rosemead and uh, they say valid. So I'll say that to you. Valid, valid. Oh. Fair oh. enough. Um, oh. But I'm just, you know, I just think Poirier is at towards the end of his rope. Let's see some big fights. If it's not for the title, let's see him in some other big fights. Uh, Gaethje getting a crack at the title, I guess, makes more sense. Um, are those octagon glasses, Keith Ballard? Yes, these are octagon glasses. And here's an octagon right next to me. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So there's a lot of cages around here, folks. Can you tell I'm an MMA fan? <laughs> it's just a coincidence with the glasses. Thank you. Appreciate so you guys admiring the glasses um I, I was very impressed by Poirier man that was my favorite fight of the night favorite performance of the night what'd you think about this last guy here Michael Venom Page Kevin Holland MVP clearly outstruck him he was super on point and he frustrated Kevin Holland something that MVP is great at is frustrating fighters and it's because of that unorthodox very karate-esque slick style he's landing a lot of right hands the spin elbows were on point and I think he honestly did a great job of dominantly winning his debut. I'm definitely excited for more Michael Venom Page fights in the UFC. Oh, for sure. Yeah, and this is just MVP's debut. So we'll probably see more out of MVP. He's got more in the tank than that. But uh, I like what Dana said at the post-fight press conference. It was something along the lines of this was the first time, you know, that Kevin Holland's ever fought somebody with a bigger ego than him. Something like that. It was pretty funny. He said something like bigger shit talker than him, maybe something like that. What, yeah. Whatever it was, whatever it was, uh, Kevin, you know, Kevin Holland had a chance with his power. And if you don't put the right shot on Michael Venom page, he's going to win that decision. Yeah, he looked good. Hey, shout out Art Long. He says, big respect to you guys. Love the show. Keep up the great work. Thank you, my man. Appreciate Thank you. you. I've saluted a lot of people today. There's a lot of love in the chat. Appreciate you guys. Let's go. Listen, I think that uh, Venom page. The fight that I called for is right. Wonderboy, personally. But he himself has said he's not interested in a Wonderboy fight because he thinks it'd be a boring fight and also because he doesn't want to kick him in the face is what he said. He likes Wonderboy. Uh, but, you know, regardless, it is the fight game. We shall see. I think that Wonderboy is actually a hard fight for Michael Venom Page, right? Because he's somebody yeah. that comes from that karate base that will have some solid reads. To me, that makes the most sense to be next, even though he's Shavkat. not interested in it. Shavkat Page? Shavkat Page? I don't think he deserves Shavkat. Ooh, deserves. AJ used the word deserve. What does he deserve, AJ? I think that he deserves a fair test against Stephen Wonderboy Thompson and a great clash of karate style of strikers, but it might not be happening next. I mean, Venom Page is in a spot where maybe they're not going to give him the uh, Wonder Boy fight if he says no to it because he does have some star power and potential. What, an Ian Gary fight? I don't think they risk Ian Gary against them. I like that Ian Gary fight, actually. That's really interesting. Um, Ian Gary and Colby Covington has to be the move, though, right? So Then Wonder Boy's free. Yeah. Jack Della, Madalena, and Holland would be kind of sick. The thing with Jack Della is he just beat Gilbert Burns, right? And Speaking he calls of out Shavkat, right? So... If you call the man out, do you not get the the call out of the scariest guy? Uh, doesn't have a strap. I don't know. I feel like if there's anybody to fast track, it's JDM. He's just so exciting to watch. I mean, everybody's going to try to take him down. You guys heard me say that Gilbert Burns would take JDM down, and I was right. 
Right. Now, what was interesting about the fight was the fact that JDM kept getting up. I figured Gilbert could control him better than that. JDM did a good job getting back to his feet. Real sense of urgency there. Like when he got his back taken in the first round, you got a real world-class guy on your back. So back to my friend Kevin. Again, don't take the back. Go to Mount. Um, you know, I, I think JDM had a pretty good performance, but he was taken down like six or seven times. It was a lot. So um, finally, he need him in the face, you know, but that took a while. He could have potentially lost that decision. I know he landed better shots, um, but he got taken down a lot. So that's a problem for him. You might as well just put him in like fun fights and fast track him. Yeah. I think so. What do you think for JDM? You don't like Shavkat next, or you do? I, I'm down with, yeah, Shavkat. I think it would be fun to put him against these strikers since everybody's going to take him down, unless you really feed him to a lion. Like, you know, if, if, if Hamza was coming back to 170 or something, you just feed him. But, um, you know, I, I, I feel like at 170, him and Ian Gary's fun. Again, Colby, please. Um, but yeah, Shavkat makes a lot of sense. I guess Bilal Muhammad should be getting the title shot, but if not, that also checks a lot of boxes. Bilal Muhammad, JDM's cool. Bilal Muhammad JDM is interesting, right? Because Bilal yeah. he beat Gilbert Burns, right? So common yeah. opponent there. I'd be open to that fight for sure. We shall see what the UFC decides, but I like the ballsy call out of the scary Shavkat Rachmanov. Now, fight before, I got to rep Pyotr Jan. He pulled it off. He got the win over Song Yudong in a competitive clash, and that was my lock of the week. So felt good, good to job. get that lock streak rolling. Thank you, my man. And then fight good before job, that, we had... Curtis Blades exposing jail to Almeida completely. Ooh, 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 ooh. Yeah, okay. I told you, suckers. I know everybody was on Almeida. Curtis Blades finished him. That's a statement. That is. That is a statement. He, he weird fight, man. Weird fight. Jail to Almeida is still going to give a lot of guys trouble with his grappling at you know two sixty five heavyweight. If he chooses to you know continue fighting and this doesn't send him into some retirement. But you have to say the chin is a little worrisome against certain strikers that can stay on their feet. It'd be interesting. But if you're taking Curtis Blades down, you're probably taking 99% of heavyweights on the planet down. I mean, for sure. Yeah, Curtis Blades is a monster. You know, you stand next to the dude and you're like, this is a different species. Like when a guy is six foot five or six foot four or whatever, and a real 280 where he's got to be in great shape to make weight. He's a freak, dude. How would you even lock your hands around his hips to take him down? I mean, if I was holding his hips, it's like, what is yeah. the waistline? My man is huge. So, um, you know, you get a heavyweight like Curtis Blades. He's hard to move, man. And that's eventually what melted Almeida. Almeida was shooting on him on the fence, right? And then just got pummeled. 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 Good shit. UFC 299 was a fun card. Also, Rebellis to Spain with a quick knockout early in the night to break out. Mataj Gamrock got a win over Dos Anjos. Macy Barber uh, is essentially, you know, the top three as far as contenders go in the UFC women's flyweight division. It was a solid card. We got a big card coming, though, this week. It's Vegas 88, and it might not be UFC 299, but I'll tell you, it's still a damn banger. So without further ado... Let's jump into it. UFC Vegas 88. First fight of the night is Chad and Helliger versus Shara Lampos Gregorio. Also, guys, if you're watching and you're enjoying, make sure you smash the likes. And if you're new to the channel, subscribe. Thank you guys for 29,000 subs on the channel during the live stream. So road to 30,000 has begun. Let's go. This AJ. Fight here. Let's go, baby. Let's go. Reward Let's that go. hard work. Thank you. Tell Thank somebody, you. folks. Bring them in. Bring them in. Bring them in. I'm going to pick Gregorio. He's got the punching power threat. He's significantly younger than Ann Helliger. And Helliger is a little bit awkward with the striking. He throws from the hips at times and has the hands low. When you fight a heavy-handed guy like Gregorio, those hands low, a perfect big straight shot, which Gregorio has a good jackhammer straight right. I think he can land it down the line. I think he'll be capable of fending off grappling attacks from Ann Helliger. I'm going to pick Gregorio to knock Ann Helliger out. Yeah, this this is looking like Ann Helliger starting to to lose his his grip a little bit. Thirty seven years old, starting to get it over the, go over the hill a little bit, and you're seeing a powerhouse across from him. So power hands and Helliger slowing down a little bit. The skid is real. I feel like um, it, it's solid to bet against him. So Gregorio probably finishing this fight with his hands makes sense. And the thing is, too, short notice replacement Ann Helliger. 
something to note. Um, not necessarily the hugest of deals because Ed Halliger is, you know, a career fighter. He's ready to go at all times. But Gregorio is going to be a hard fight for him. And I see the, the striking level difference is evident. And I do think Gregorio is capable on the ground. Now, outside of the UFC, he was a bit of a can crusher. I'm not going to lie to you. But uh, I think he can take Ed Halliger out. We're going to go with Gregorio. He's minus 162, the favorite. Chad and Halliger plus 142 as the underdog. Uh, Gregorio by KO is plus 235. Over under rounds is interesting. And Halliger normally is pretty durable, but you look at the recent opponents. I mean, Jesse Strader, Ella Tong, Haley, and Jose Johnson. I'd say the most powerful puncher there is Ella Tong, Haley, but he's not quite to the punching power of Gregorio. And on top of that as well, uh, I don't necessarily feel like uh, he was nearly as slick, right? I mean, I'm looking at how many knockouts he has. Ella Tong had five KOs, something to note. And then on the opposite side, uh, Gregorio, granted, can crusher. He's got yeah. six KOs and he's got way less fights. So I do think that Gregorio can get a KO. Can crusher is a real accusation because Ann Helliger has yeah. got more experience against real yeah. guys. You know, when you're fighting people who are zero and two, two and three shit like this, you're getting experience from it, but it's nothing like stepping in there. Like on Dana White's contender series, he had to fight a nine and three, you know, that's more legitimate. So um, a lot, lot, lot to be proven still. Definitely something I'm not throwing my bank at. Yeah, he did chin. Smotherman pretty impressively. Does Gregorio have uh no ground game? Is a question from Roth Window Cleaning Service. So I'll say this: I think that Gregorio training at the Cerro, uh, excuse me, the Longo Weidman gym with that team, you gotta assume he's getting in good rounds. From what I've seen, he has decent enough wrestling, and I don't see Ann Helliger as the wrestling threat who like can absolutely bully him for three rounds. So I'm gonna go Gregorio for the win. Yeah, and we got Pick'em MMA saying Gregorio by sub more likely than KO. So there's somebody for you. Uh, look, if you're going to bet on this one, money line, and don't put a lot. Let's go. Gregorio for the win for us both. Let's keep running. Next fight on the card, Corey McKenna versus Jacqueline Amarim. Now, initially, Mike Finch, I picked Corey McKenna, but I won't lie to you, man. I'm thinking to myself, damn. If I'm looking at most impressive moments, I have been impressed by Amarim. I want to hear what your opinion is on this Finch man, and then I'll give my take afterwards. I think Corey McKenna's built like a T Rex, but she's going to be able to out kickbox her. And you got Amarim who's going to lay on her back. I feel like Amarim mm -hmm. needs to show us better takedowns, the ability to get to the top position because on bottom, I don't see her submitting McKenna. She could potentially do what Mackenzie Dern does is get sweeps off of her back. But I think on the feet, McKenna should be able to fight to a decision when the kickboxing exchanges get in and out and then um if she defends takedowns she's got this shit so i'm gonna go on the side of miss t-rex Corey mckenna so i've been picking mckenna right and i'm not pick flipping right now but i will say jacqueline amarim has a 10 inch reach advantage granted doesn't use it well she's not a boxer and like what you said about her fight where she'll shoot for takedowns but fall to her back was like the biggest reason I picked McKenna because I could see McKenna out wrestling her. And I think that McKenna has a clear striking edge on her as well. But I will say, Amarim has very impressive jujitsu. She has nasty skills on the ground but doesn't have great takedowns offensively. And if she's on the bottom, McKenna, she's like a lifelong martial artist at this point. She started at like 13. She's very knowledgeable about positions. She's an absolute sponge. Like she's in her early 20s right now. I'm going to pick McKenna by a decision, but I don't know, man. It's like there's a little hunch in me that thinks Amarim by sub is not a bad idea. It's more just due to the fact that I think Corey McKenna has a more well-versed game. And it's also the fact that I'm honestly standing opposed to consistently picking these fucking jujitsu fighters that don't wrestle well and then fall to their back on takedown attempts. And I don't want to be picking fighters that give up bottom position very often. I've made mistakes of it in the past, believing that maybe they can find subs, but it's 2024. How often are we seeing submissions from bottom in MMA these days? Yeah, it, it's hard to submit somebody off your back who's good. You know, right. you could right. submit somebody off your back who sucks, like, right. like really well, but especially on a mat, 
you know, right. in the UFC, you get to compete on a mat. If we're competing on asphalt or concrete, now it's getting worse to be on your back, right? Yeah. But, um, you know, you think about the context of an MMA fight. It's five-minute rounds. They're going to stand you up every five minutes, okay? Right. You only get 15 minutes or 25 minutes to compete. So it just constantly gives the edge to the striking. You know, if you're a jiu-jitsu fighter, you would want a 25-minute period where you're going nonstop. That's going to be right. way better better for you if you're going to submit somebody off of your back right you're going to want time to work uh and then you also want ideally no time limit right so because of the context of fighting in the ufc it's not very smart to be a guard puller right you want to be able to get takedown so um while it it, it, it does make sense with no time rules it's 2024 folks she's got to win this decision i think Corey mckenna is more well suited to get this fight on the scorecards um and amarim is more suited to get a finish amarim if she gets to a top position though i could see her su sub and mckenna so it's a fight mckenna's minus 125 money line amarim is plus 105 as the underdog here let's look at something mckenna by decision only plus 125 and then uh, Amarim by sub plus 200. I don't know. Maybe you could do an over two and a half, maybe in a potential parlay, and then have a slight hedge with this Amarim by sub line at plus 200 because I'd be pretty shocked if McKenna chinned there. I mean, McKenna's not just going to like come out there with a Superman punch and lay her right. out. Now that I said that, I hope she does. Uh, Pam and Sahota, let's go, AJ and Finch, with the knowledge. Y'all been helping me make money he be watching us every week. Pam and I appreciate that. Now pay your taxes. There's a way to donate to this channel. I'll take my 10%. Thank you very much. Yes, Macy Barber coming through for me on Saturday. And of course, so did Sugar Sean O'Malley in the main event. Yes, I bet myself as well. And I uh, put my money where my mouth is on Saturday. So um, we're on a roll, folks. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go, baby. Let's keep running. Next fight. On the card, we have Josh Kulabayal versus Danny Silva. I like it. Danny Silva was involved in one of the best fights I've seen, and yep. it was a war with Angel Pacheco on Dana White's Contender Series. And now he's getting thrown in the UFC against a quality veteran who is a primary striker, somebody that I think has maybe a bit of a speed advantage on him as well. I got to favor Kula Bayo to get a decision because I'm going with the UFC experienced fighter who's done well. I mean, he has a draw with Charles Jordan. He had a little win streak. And then last time out, he took a loss to Lerone Murphy, who's a ranked fighter in the UFC featherweight division. This is a very hard fight for Danny Silva coming in with a debut. And I don't know. I think that they gave him too much of a jump up the ranks for a first time in the UFC, especially after such an emphatic fight on contender series. But you know, he's the type of guy who's willing to get into wars like that and willing to take difficult fights like this. I'm going to pick Kula Bell on the scorecards, though. I think he's technically a bit better. Yeah, Silva's live. Silva was impressive on Dana White's Contender Series. They both got contracts. The fight was so good. But Kula Bayow has six fights in the UFC and not against scrubs, right? He's got wins against Shailon Nordenbeke, Sung Woo Choi. Uh, that Lerone Lero Murphy fight was close, as you said. So I think Kula Bayow's got a lot to offer. His experience should help him here. I think he wins two out of three rounds, 29-28 decision. In a good fight, though, this is a cool matchup. I think it's going to be entertaining clash of strikers, man. Odds favor Kula Bayow at minus 184. Danny Silva plus 159. The over two and a half is minus 205, which might be a little bit sweaty when you have two good strikers like this. But I do think it probably goes over. Kula Bayow by decision, only plus 100. So that's his expected method of victory win, too. All right. Dixon's hating on our pronun pronunciation. Kuli Bao Bao is what Kulibao. he said. Kula Bao Kula Bao Kula Bao. AJ Kulibao. likes to throw a little sauce on it, you know, keeps Kulibao. it interesting for the folks. I think I'm saying it perfectly fine. Kula Bao Kula Bao. Everybody's got a slightly different accent, man. <laughs> Sometimes things are said a little bit differently, bro. He says you triggered him, dude. He That's funny. You shit. Kula Bao. There's no safe spaces on Moneyline, all right? This is a fight talk show. <laughs> Let's go, baby. Kula Bayo for the win for Finchman and I. Let's keep running. Next fight on the card is Tiago Moises versus Mitch Ramirez. 
Mitch Ramirez is a ballsy guy stepping in here, fighting on short notice against a crafty veteran, 11 fight UFC veteran, very good jujitsu practitioner. Okay. Stand up game. I got to go with Moises to win. Something I feel like with Ramirez too that has to be said is he gets stuck in the mud a little bit striking. And at times I feel like he's very heavy footed. Now he's coming off a finish win over uh, Tavares. I'm forgetting the first name of the opponent. It was Arian Tavares. And that was not too long ago, nearly three months ago. Fight before that, he was a contender series fighter. He lost to Carlos Prates, upper weight class at 170. And uh, he got beaten up pretty bad. But Prates is a killer, so we'll give him a pass on that loss. I think that Tiago Moises has the clear-cut grappling advantage and then taking the fight on short notice. I favor Moises in the later rounds to end up subbing him. Tiago Moises all day in this matchup. I would be picking him without the short notice. So the short notice is just a nice little cherry on top. Makes it bet bettable for me. Mitch Ramirez just not proven much yet. I know that Tiago Moises has some miles on him, but he's only 28 years old, man. And he's got all the LFA experience, the UFC experience. We've seen him a long time. Um, you know, just because what, you know, St. Saint, Saint Denis finishes him, we're out. Like, no way, man. This guy's got a big advantage on the ground. And AJ maybe an advantage on the feet. I don't know. I think he's more well-rounded clearly, but I don't see a huge threat for him. You know, I think that there's a chance that he wins this fight all three phases. So you add the short notice on top of it. Tiago Moises, I like a lot in this matchup. Tiago Moises for both of us to get it done. Now, as far as the odds for this fight, Moises is currently sitting at minus 360. With Ramirez at plus 295. Expected line, specifically with the short notice replacement, Ramirez as well. I think Moises is probably going to end up being live for a submission finish. The under two and a half, though, juiced as hell at minus 210. I'm going with Moises by sub as his finch, man. Moises, uh, I didn't actually say sub, but like, yeah, you you yeah. read in my mind at this point. We've done so many shows. Yeah, why not? He should be able to finish him, but maybe yeah. it's a TKO. I don't like you. You know what the show's name is called? Do Money. that. Money line minus 340, little wide, but if it is a parlay piece, I don't think you're uh, going crazy doing such a thing. Let's keep running. Next fight on the card, we have O'Day Osborne versus Jafiel Filio in a battle of striker versus grappler. Now, Filio isn't a complete bum in the stand-up. He did get a knockout win on a contender series, but the grappling is where he's 100% going to thrive. O'Day Osborne has been submitted a couple times inside of the UFC, and I do think that Filio has a good chance of following suit and submitting Osborne. I mean, he nearly beat Mohamed Mokayev with a fully locked in knee bar that I'd say 98% of the roster is going to tap to. It's just Mokayev was with that. I'm not losing. Let that shit break type mentality. I don't think Odie Osborne has those same capabilities. I think a clear cut jujitsu advantage and the reason, right? We're going with Filio. And we talked about a jujitsu fighter earlier in Amarim. The difference is Filio does have offensive wrestling that he can use to get the fight to where he's most confident. And I'm going to pick Filio to win by sub. Yeah, Filios look good against everybody except Makayev. Makayev was able to get to the top position uh, in, in that fight. And uh, yeah, that knee bar we talk about a lot. That knee bar went, if, I feel like we talk about it more because it wasn't the end of the fight, right? Yeah. Like if he tapped to it, it might have come up less. Like at this right. point, we've we, we've exhausted that knee bar. Uh, it, it was a cool one. I, I do think Ode Osborne's a better striker. I got to give him that. Sure. I think that there's a pathway for Ode Osborne to win this fight. The thing he has to do is keep range. I think this is a battle of range because if he's just clashing with Filho, I think he is going to get taken down. But if he keeps him on the outside, which Ode does pretty well, and he could create it more of a sparring match, there's a way he gets two out of three rounds here. So tougher fight to me than um, what what I just heard you lay out. But I'll, I'll double up with you because of something that you did point out, which is very important. That is, Filho does have the ability to wrestle as well as apply, apply his jujitsu. So if he can get takedowns, big if though, I think he wins the fight. Uh, give me Filho decision in a close one where he he is getting kickboxed up a little bit on the outside. I talk about striking in zones, right? Green zones when you're far away, yellow zones where Max Holloway works or we're right in front of him, right? And then red zones where Mike Tyson works where you get right in the person's chest. If this fight is in the green zone, Ode Osborne can win. Odie Osborne, for sure, from distance, is dangerous with a length edge, too. 
I just question his ability to do three rounds, especially at the apex, right? That small cage favors Filio so much, right? Three steps, and next thing you know, he's backed up, and I think Filio's going to work well at the uh, the takedowns from there too, man. We're going Filio. Solid point. Small cage, better for these guys who have like aggressive grappling. Remember right. Baez taking down JDM. The right. little cage helps these guys get a hold of you. It makes action happen as well. I think that's why they do it. You know, I think the small yeah. cage is a little bit of gamesmanship, right? Like old school boxing, you couldn't wear black gloves because you can't see them. Well, everybody wears black gloves in the UFC. You know, right. they make the cage a little smaller for more action. I think they know what they're doing up there and uh, small cages do, do change fights. It's a good point. Now, as far as the odds, Filio is minus 178 with Osborne at plus 153. The dog, Filio to win by sub, expected outcome currently sitting at plus 165. Mm, I could see why you'd bet on it, but I'll remain skeptical. Fair, fair. Filio for the win as far as picks go for both of us. Bit of a favorite, but should have a clear cut grappling advantage let's keep running next fight on the card we have Josiana Nunez versus Chelsea Chandler I'm gonna be picking Chelsea Chandler to win I like Stockton California people you know I like the savages I like the Diaz army I think that she's a dangerous striker she's got a pretty good game like losing to Norma Dumont I don't think is an awful loss in a sophomore UFC appearance. I expect her to have a physicality edge on Nunez, and I think she could get on top. Something with Nunez is we haven't really seen her tested in the grappling. Everybody wants to sit and strike with her. I think Chelsea Chandler is going to have a clear-cut strength advantage. She's a lot larger than, than Nunez naturally. She's got a big height advantage over her. Now, as far as the reach, I don't think there's much of a difference. I'll double-check. We got topology. On the screen right over here. Let's see. Let's double check this reach, but I'm pretty sure it's about the same. Uh, 68 to 67. So granted, six inch height advantage for Chandler, not a significant reach advantage. I do think though that Chelsea Chandler can pull this one off. I think she could even get a finish with ground and pound. I think she could put it on Nunez. Nunez is on a beautiful roll right now. You know, UFC debut took out Bia Malecki, who isn't all that great. Beat Romana Pasquale, isn't all that great, and beat Zara Farron. So in all honesty, Josiana Nunez is 3-0 in the UFC with three wins against essentially cans, back-end fighters for sure, or fighters that are no longer with the organization either. I don't think any of Nunez's opponents are currently with the promotion. Chandler beat Stoliarenko and then lost to Dumont. I just think Chelsea Chandler has a clear path to victory if she ties up with Nunez and doesn't just let her tee off. Like Too many fighters let Josiana Nunez dictate the pace back them up and just tee off. Well, maybe Chelsea Chandler is going to look to take her down and then Nunez swinging those big hooks gets caught off balance and put on the ground and beaten up. You guys are crazy if you're going to bet on this fight. I don't know, man. I, You know, you kind of got a root for Chandler. I see why you like Stockton. Yeah. But uh, Nunez has got some power on her. I know she's like two feet tall, but uh, and, and she's been in some ugly fights, but I think she hits harder. I do think that she does have some jujitsu on the ground and definitely her striking is, uh, you know, what's, what's, what's winning her a lot of these fights. So, so I'll, I'll stick with Nunez on this one. Um, Chandler's got an opportunity here, you know, uh, not much UFC experience, and this is a very winnable fight for her. Um, it's going to be, you know, I'm going to learn a lot about Chandler in this matchup. As far as Nunez goes, I think it's pretty obvious, you know, land some big shots, don't get taken down and she wins this fight. Um, so I, I'll go with Nunez, probably a close decision. Definitely one that, uh, we're just going to check where they're at. And the chat has been wiling out about this one. All right. You guys have been wiling out about Nunez, this whole chat. Keep it PG-13 in our chat, folks. Behave yourselves, boys. <laughs> Nunez looks like Carlos Prates from Pickham. That was funny. <laughs> That's the least of it. <laughs> Listen, That's I'm going least. with Chandler, baby. I'm going her to win, and I'm picking her as a dog. I don't think she's a terrible underdog attack. I think she can win this fight. Plus 130 line currently with Nunez and minus 150. I got a feeling that she's getting her hand raised, man. All right. I got a feeling Nunez is going to get her hand raised because yeah. she's going to land some key shots. But yeah, I, I think it's close, right? <sighs> no. Nunez hasn't been tested, tied up. What happens if Chandler? Down. I think she could because I think Chandler's stronger. Like with Josiana Nunez, I've always felt like she looks like a, you know, kind of Jessica Andrade type. Like she's kind of a, 
you know, not to say a carbon copy, but she's like a, you know, new Jessica Andrade. I don't want to call her a great value Jessica Andrade, but I might have to. But that's similar style, right? Big hooks. Hasn't shown much on the ground, though. And I think Chelsea Chandler's uh, pretty scrappy, bro. I, I like Chelsea Chandler a lot. Could be the Diaz bias because she looks like the damn Diaz sister. But I'm picking it up a little off. You know, when people call you scrappy, they're also saying you don't have good defense. Give me Nunes. Damn. Damn. Finch man going Nunes. I'm going Chandler. We're split on this one. But let's keep running up. Next fight on the card is our featured prelim of the night. It's Mike Davis versus Natan Levy. I think that Mike Davis does everything Natan Levy does better. And I also think he's physically stronger and a clearly superior athlete. I think Mike Davis is striking. He's got a little more snap on his shots. He's a little more accurate. I think in the grappling, he's got a strength advantage, which I believe is a factor. His athleticism is superior. Natan Levy's not bad, though. I would say that he's a quality and well-rounded guy. Both of these guys have well-rounded games where they can strike pretty well and they can mix it up in the ground well. Mike Davis, unfortunately, he's been plagued with a bit of inactivity uh, but ultimately I think he's good right making his debut against Gilbert Burns he lost in 2019 but currently on a three fight win streak last fight he beat Slava Claus he actually touched him a bit in the striking but for the most part was landing the key takedowns and controlling in the grappling I'm going to pick Mike Davis to win a decision here against Natan Levy Natan Levy's going to give him a run for his money man I think Slava Claus obviously a way better striker but the hole in his game is really obvious, right? As to where Natan Levy is more lethal, as his nickname would suggest. So tough fight for me, man. I do think Natan Levy has a pathway here um, as long as he doesn't end up on his back. You know, Mike Davis definitely going to try to hit these double legs, and he's got a lot of KOs. Seven wins by knockout. I mean, Mike Davis could definitely get this thing done on the feet. So really close fight. I wouldn't I wouldn't be surprised if this one was another close one. No way I'm touching it, AJ, especially since Natan Levy, kind of a large dog. I got to be honest. I looked at the odds, and it made me want to go Levy since I didn't know who to pick here. I think my initial gut feel was Davis. Davis did look good against Slava Claus, and no shame in losing to Gilbert Burns a long time ago, you know? So he could be on a roll here. He's just going to, um, you know, he's going to be off against some real competition. I think that Tom Levy gives him a run for his money. I think this does go all rounds. Well, I think it goes all around, so I'll agree with you on an over at minus 200, but I'm pretty confident that Mike Davis dominates his fight at minus 290, the favorite, bro. What the fuck? Three, three, three to one odds, you take three it? To one. <sighs> Not as money line. I put it in the parlay, though. Okay. I like Mike Davis a lot, bro. I tried to get Mike Davis on the show, something to know. Oh, shit. Oh, you never hit me. He never hit me back. Me, bro. He never hit me back. He, he, he replied to my first DM and then. Left me hanging when I mentioned the uh, the show. I was like, "Come on, bro, we got we got a lot of subs." All right, fair enough. I'm underrating Mike Davis. We'll see That's what fine. he's got. Did you see Brock Lesnar comment? A Brock Lesnar's in the chat, guys. You Look saw at Brock that. Brock Lesnar in the chat. It's Super Samoan Legal Team. He commented. Uh, he's asking us about the drug testing policy. Whatever. I just thought it was funny that well, it's Super drugs. Samoan Legal Team, and it's the picture of Brock Lesnar. That dude, you're killing. That it is funny. Comments. I appreciate that you love the content. Uh, the UFC is probably testing less because they don't have USADA anymore. So, you know, maybe we'll see some physiques blow up and then a uh, little acne on the fucking backs and we'll uh, be a little suspicious. I don't know. We'll find out here this year. Brock, we appreciate you jumping in the chat. My question for you is, why aren't you headlining UFC 300? If not headlining, could we get a co-main event? Could we get a fun fight? You know, Fedor retired. Let's bring him in for one. Fedor versus Brock Lesnar for UFC 300. For the, do it for the fans. Do it for the fans. You know, come on. Can we get a fun one? Why, Brock, are you standing us up? I want to hear the real story here, okay? Because no. UFC 300 is still truly main event list right wonderful card but give us a freak show fight brock respond to us when you when, when you could collect that answer for me you know hanato moicano jalen turner got added to the prelims of 300 bro the free the prelims were are the prelims they are free the prelims, prelims yeah. are already fire yeah i mean yeah, stacked they they're they killed it top not top to bottom bottom almost to the top they killed it we just need a headliner, guys. How are you going to let 299's headline be better than 300? How dare How dare you? How dare you? I think, though, when the fight takes place, I think that Pereira and Jamal Hill draws. 
I don't know, not more excitement necessarily, like because Sean O'Malley brings in a certain level of casual excitement, but it draws the excitement because of the potential for absolute violence between those two strikers. Yeah. Yeah, I guess. I mean, I could see it going one of two, you know, two different ways, right? It's like Pejia just dominates because he's so much better or Jamal Hill just slams an overhand right in there. You know, it's like Jamal Hill's got the weapon that is the kryptonite for Pejia. Pejia yeah. just stands up really tall and, and, and walks forward. Like the obvious shot is the overhand right, right? He's a chat. And I'm bro. just realizing now we didn't talk about Francis and Ganu versus AJ. We'll do that after the at the end. At the end, we'll do that. Yeah. End of the card. We got to break that one down. Yeah. Um, and no, I did not pick Levy. I picked Davis. Pay attention, folks. Let's go. Let's keep running up. Let's jump to our main card opener. If you guys haven't yet, make sure you smash the likes. And if you're new to the channel, subscribe. We got Gerald Mearshart versus Brian Barbarana going down. It's a true clash of grappler versus striker. And Barbarina is a former welterweight. And I think that he's going to be outmatched when we hit the ground. Mearshart's submission game is solid. Now, I think that Barbarina has a striking advantage. And like, I don't know, with Gerald Mearshart, I could see him turtling up and taking some bombs on the chin and going down. But against the former welterweight, I just think Mearshart is going to be able to control him. In the grappling, I do think he can control him against the cage. I think he can get the back. I think he can get the choke. Watch for all the submissions of Mearshart. Barbarana is a guy that has been out grappled in multiple fights. I mean, his last three losses have been because of grappling sequences. Loss starting his, you know, move up, uh, you know, to 185 was against a kickboxer in Mukmud Muradov, and he was getting taken down in that fight. Mearshart has a win over Muradov, but stylistic fights, you know, they, they make them. It doesn't necessarily mean it's a guarantee, but I think Mearshart's got a clear path. RDA sub, Barbarena, Gunnar Nelson, and I think Mearshart should sub him. I'm going with Mearshart by sub. Keith Ballard says Bear Jew by sub. You got the wrong grappler, son. That's that ain't the shit. Bear Jew. That ain't Paul. This is Gerald Mearshart, dog. Gerald Mearshart is going to be competitive on the feet with Brian Barbarana, AJ. Gerald Mearshart dropped. Uh, who's the striker? Bruno, Bruno. Silva. Yeah. So, so Gerald Mearshart's much closer to being able to strike with Brian Barbarena than, and I know you identified this, than Brian Barbarena is to grapple with Jared Mearshart. Brian Barbarena is getting smoked, folks. Gerald Mearshart's going to wrap that neck up like a Christmas present with a bow on it. I think Gerald Mearshart should dominate this fight and he's my boy. So I'm sending in this clip, Gerald Mearshart. I'm betting you by sub. So don't you dare take this guy all three rounds. Get him out of there for us, Gerald. I need to upgrade my car. I'm still driving a Toyota Corolla. Help me out, Gerald. We need a sub here. And this man has the most submissions in the division's history in the UFC. He's going to get another one. Gerald Mearshart, rear naked strangle. So listen, Finch, if you want to get a new car, I can talk to you about Mearshart's odds, right? The money line is minus 240. So if you want a new car, my friend, you're going to have to throw some change at that. But if you do believe in submission, oh. you got plus 110. So like if you got 10K, let's turn it into 20. You know what I'm saying? Plus okay. 110. Huh. I, I'll tell you what, coming back from the Oscars, we were driven in a new Tesla. It's the one where the doors go up. What was it? Model X? Do I have yeah. that one right? Yeah. The butterfly yeah. with the butterfly doe. Stunt, stunting is a habit. Get like me. Have you ever seen the Chevy with the butterfly doe? Are you too young for that song? Um, I, uh, yeah. I really think that, uh, you know, Gerald Mearshart's going to win by sub here. So I don't, I don't usually bet a finish, right? I'm a money line guy, right? right. This time I like Mearshart sub. Mearshart sub. Let's go. It's a minus 240 money line for those interested in that straight line. Mearshart by sub gives you plus 110. Not the juiciest of plus money, but uh still, you know, better than minus 240. Mearshart for the win for us both. We believe in it. We believe in our guy. And I think he's tapping a scrappy striker in Barbarina, but somebody that has consistently struggled with grapplers. He lost to Jason Witt. Well, Jason Witt was landing takedowns and throwing them off, and then Jason Witt was getting chinned by everybody after. So something to note is Barbarina against grapplers. It's his script tonight. You know when Gerald Mearshart got faxed that paper, faxed like it's yeah. the 90s, faxed emailed, them. printed out that paper, and he signed his name on the fight, Brian Barbarina. He was thinking, hmm. 
take down rear naked. You know that's what he's thinking. 100%. I think he's going to execute it. Me too. Me too. Let's go. Next fight, ladies fight. Macy Chiasson versus Penny Kianzad 2. The rematch between these ladies who fought in the Ultimate Fighter Season 28 finale some years ago. Macy Chiasson was able to win that fight. It was a rear naked choke. Kianzad, prior to the rear naked choke, did have a tight arm bar attempt, but she ended up getting reversed and then getting strangled there afterwards. Both girls have improved since that point, and I think they've also improved to a similar level. I think the fight is close, similar to what it was last time. I think Kianzad has better boxing. I think Chiasson is the more physically imposing threat with a slight grappling advantage. I believe Chiasson's size, too, is a factor, right? She's the taller girl, longer girl. She's got a physicality advantage. And I'm going to go with Chiasson to win a decision in this fight here against Penny Kianzad. I guess, oh man, you know, I mean, people already, there's such a reputation about betting on women's fights. These ones hit like that for me because Macy Chiasson definitely has a pathway to kind of, you know, use her length and, and, but I don't know. This is a tough one for me. <sighs> Loss to Ketlin Vieira doesn't mean much to me. So losses to Raquel Pennington and Ketlin Vieira, like panties, you know, only losing to the top of the division. Uh, wins over Lena Land Landsberg, Alexis Davis, Jar Eubanks, Betch Cohea. She's fought a lot of strikers, you know. Um, I like that. I think Panny's record kind of sucks, but she's got the goods and she's got the experience in the UFC. Uh, Macy Chiasson, very tough, you know. I guess grew up in the UFC too, but, you know, only, um, you know, I think I think it's another close decision, dude. I hate picking this fight. Kianzad was my initial pick. Do I at least got the dog? Mike Finch, you have minus nothing. You got plus 172. Thank you. Yeah, you got plus money. I got minus 202 on Chiasson. Over two and a half is minus 360, but I don't I don't know. Something to say, and for me, this would be a stay away type matchup here. I mean, Grant, I'm already considering throwing down underdog Chelsea Chandler. So now to double up, yeah, I'm going to bet another women's fight. Now I'm going minus 200. <laughs> but I think, though, I really do think that Chiasson has a good chance to pull this off. But I do okay. understand why you're on Kianzad because I was looking at her touch Chiasson with some punches in their last fight, and she yeah. can box, right? So it's a coin flip fight. The odds favor Chiasson. So I understand intriguing side, potentially on the dog. Now the question is, Finch, is this an underdog that you back with faith, or is it a dog pick? Th th this fight can be so close. I mean, these women are so well matched. You know, they're at similar points with their um, with their skill set. So, how am I going to really back either one? I mean, if you look at the losses, Macy's got Irene Aldana. She was just the champ. Raquel Pennington. It's like, you know, they lose to the top of the division. They're kind of like at that gatekeeper level right now. It's a it's a well matched fight. Um, so I think you know that that that's why when I look at those odds. It makes me uh, double down on Kianzad. But Kianzad, I was thinking already. Um, Macy Chiasson, gatekeeper. Macy Chiasson, can she even make weight at 135 yeah, pounds? Because she's a big girl. She was fighting at 40 and 45. She's made 35, but she's missed at 35. Note something, Mike Finch. Records for them in the UFC are close to five and four, Panny Kianzad, six and three, Macy Chiasson. So, uh, you know, these girls, I really believe, are at similar levels. And I think Chiasson, tad bigger, tad, tad better. Uh, and I think she can win. But I understand the Kianzad love. I think she's got some pop. Especially yeah. since these girl fights go crazy all the time. And they're given the odds are too wide, folks. Why is Macy Chiasson deserving of two to one? I guess it's just because she won the last one, man. I mean, you know, it's like it's like what she 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 loses to Irene Aldana. And then has two canceled fights. I don't, you know, I, 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 I don't know. I, I think that uh, in, in the time since they fought, they've both, you know, had some good experience. So um, it'll be, a, it'll be more competitive this time. Let's go. Win for Macy Chiasson for me. Win Give me for the Penny Kianzad. Why not? Why not Let's grab go. an occasional dog when you don't know? Fuck it. Let's go. Let's go, Finch. Let's go. Let's keep running. Next fight on the card, we have Christian Rodriguez versus Isaac Dolgarian. 
Listen, Mike Finch, Rodriguez is moving up to 145 after consistently missing weight at 135. And I will not forget that first round against Rosas where he was bodied a bit. I said this on my last show. Isaac Dolgarian would take Rosas. He would spin him on his fucking finger and throw him in a trash can. This is the different level of strength and wrestling ability. Dolgarian's a fucking man. He's the fucking man. I think Dolgarian is going to destroy Rodriguez. And now I do believe Christian Rodriguez is a skilled guy. But he's a 35er that can't get his weight cut right. Isaac Dolgarian is much stronger and a much more physically imposing threat. From top position, I think Dolgarian can drop some hammers. He's known for the first round finish. I think he could yeah. also submit Rodriguez. I like inside the distance Dolgarian. I believe in the hype. I think the dude's very good. I noticed it before he came to the UFC when he was taking on Francis Marshall. I picked him in that fight. And I don't know, there's certain guys that I think have a capability where they could go far. I mean, he's also got a badass nickname, the Midwest Chopper. He was a plus 145 dog against Francis Marshall. And I think he's going to win here against Christian Rodriguez as a slight favorite. I've been calling Christian Rodriguez fights back when he was an amateur, man. I saw him <laughs> choke out Harry Valdez. I've seen him come up. He's a much better striker, I believe, than Delgarian. He's definitely very poised, but... There's a difference in size. There's a difference in strength. Dalgarian's a freight train, and when he gets to the top position, he is a finisher as well. Now, Rodriguez is going to be tougher to finish, so the one thing I will caution folks on doing is betting the under here. I think this is a matchup where Rodriguez has the ability to slow a fight down. You know, he's trained a roof of sport with a lot of great finishers, and he at least has the capability to slow Dalgarian down. It is a bit of a step up for Dalgarian, but um, yeah, he's a real featherweight and Rodriguez is not. AJ makes a great point there. The wrestling is not close. Um, Rodriguez did look good against a strong, fast starting kid, right? But this is going to be a whole other level. And, you know, I think he could slow the fight down, but still get dominated, man. I'll give me 30-27 Delgarian, but this will be the first time he's tested and the first time he has to show us that he has cardio. Let's go. Respect the call. I'm glad we're on the same side, Finch, man. He's a minus 175 favorite with Rodriguez at plus 150 as the underdog. The over rounds is minus 125. Isaac Dolgarian has never been outside of a first round. That's something to note about him as a professional. And if you look at his amateur career, he hasn't been out of the first round there either. So that would be new territory, new water. Doesn't mean he couldn't do well outside of the round. And something that I was surprised at, when I looked at topology picks, 74% are picking Rodriguez. So I would say the people's underdog this week seems to be Christian Rodriguez. And I think uh, fading the public here makes a lot of sense. I think Dolgarian might not have the recognition with the masses as much yet, but he's a savage. I'm going with uh, Dolgarian. What are the odds? What are you talking about? The odds favor Dolgarian, but Topology's poll favors Rodriguez substantially. You're kidding. Huge, oh, that's huge. a nice money line. That, like I'm friends with Christian Rodriguez on Facebook. Don't send this to him, folks. That's no. a nice money line. Let's Minus jot this one down. Yeah, I figured good. Dolgarian two to one for sure. Yeah, so it's it's a little less than that. And it was actually less. Like if you would have got it yesterday, Mike Finch. You could have got it. I believe it was down to minus 140. Let me check what it was at yesterday. See, that's when I grabbed minus Sugar Sean. I grabbed Sugar Sean way out from the fight when the odds that's were better. pretty tight. Yeah. Uh, for whatever reason. So, you know, some sometimes you got to wait for weigh-ins, right? Macy Chiasson, you might want to make sure she makes weight. Fights like these, dude, those odds opened my eyes. Dolgarian for the win. My call. Dolgarian for the win. Finch man's call. We're confident. And I'm ready to see Dolgarian shine here in a uh, sophomore appearance in the UFC. Let's keep running up. Next fight on the card is Kennedy and Zechiku versus Ovin St. Pru. Mike Finch, OSP is coming back from the dead and he's sleeping in Zechiku. In my dream last night, not in reality, I think he's getting knocked out. Okay, because the truth of the matter be told, OSP got destroyed by Felipe Linz in a round. Not that Felipe Linz isn't decent. He just won Saturday and he's got quality striking. But to chin him in like a minute? Like, holy shit, OSP's chin seems to be gone. Fight before that, he has a split decision with the corpse of Shogun Hua. <laughs> I think that Ovin St. Pru is washed. And I like OSP. OSP is going to see this and not my other show and not hear the praise that I give him. I've been watching <laughs> OSP since he was fucking like eight and four as a pro. I watched him in Strike Force. I always liked his style. I always thought he was tricky to deal with. And in his prime, he's a very dangerous fight for Kennedy and Zetchku because of his unorthodox punching. Right now, though, 
I worry about one shot landing for Nzechuku and St. Pru going down. Yeah. Nzechuku's a big dude as well at 6'5 with long arms. I'm going Nzechuku first round knockout, Finch. Nzechuku all day because it's a 40 year old OSP. Right. OSP was very dangerous for a time there. His danger has gone down as he's gotten slower, though, and he doesn't have the technical tool bag to rely on, right? Like mm -hmm. some people get older, but their wrestling's still there or certain things are still there. All St. Pru has got is a puncher's chance, and that's not anything to bet on or rely on. So uh, we got to go in Zechaku. We got to go with the kid who's going to be a lot faster and have a, has a bright future in the UFC. As to where OSP at this point, you know, is he thinking title shot someday? No. So what is he doing here? Collecting checks, man. I think uh, Nzechuku is the way to go. The problem is the bookies figured that out too. So these these odds suck, and I wouldn't touch it. Nzechuku first round. That's a decent call, plus 130. Reason being, Nzechuku has shown submission skills, and if you're going to be kicking the fuck out of yourself, if you play the knockout in the first round and he wins in the first round. So if you are thinking about round propping, first round Nzechuku kind of called my name because I think he can put a pace on Ovin St. Pru early. Now the odds get way better as you go to the second round. It's plus 315. But I think he knocks out St. Pru early in the fight. Nzechuku has not finished a fight in the first round since 2018. Jesus. He he, he is much more of a round two, round Maybe three round two finisher. Two one. And, um, you know, OSP has been knocked out a couple times, but... I don't know, dog. Maybe maybe you're on it. Maybe you've got it. Maybe you've got it. I don't mean to even sit here and talk people out of it, but I'm just looking at a little history here. History yeah. doesn't always predict the future. A little overrated. Um, in this matchup, I see an Nzechuku KO. I just don't know if it's the first round. Plus 130 yeah. is kind of enticing, though. So that, those, that's a lot better than minus 500 money line on Nzechuku. Right. That's all I'm saying. Right. Let's go. Nzechuku to get the finish is a call for me. There's a call for Finch. Yeah. We're both on him. We think he's taking out OSP. He's a minus 500 money line, though, so you're probably in a spot where he's only a parlay piece. But just recognize that he's fighting a substantially lesser version of what was a prime Ovin St. Pru. and I really don't know much, how much OSP got left. Brock Lesnar says OSP slept Menifield not that long ago. That was four years ago, brother. So in the last four years, as he's turned 40, I do think we see a diminished OSP. I agree. Listen, guys, I see 59 likes up in here. What I want to see 70 likes, and then I'll hit the saxophone for Finchman and I to finish off with <laughs> the uh, rest of the show. You want a saxophone? I got it next to me. I'm a musical gift. I'm a musical <laughs> talent, okay? And uh, I'll do it. For the people, chat says guess AJ's potential lock if you can. You guys should guess. You guys should guess it. I I, I can definitely guess it. All I right. got it. I'll write it down. Where's the pen? write it down and then show me at the end. Yeah, where's a pen? Haley, run me a pen. She might be sleeping. Um, waking her up. I'll put it in my phone. I'll have it typed out. Okay. All right. All right. All right. All right. OSP, you're too old, son. Next. OSP, we apologize, but we're picking against you. Let's go. Let's keep running up and let's get to our co main event. It's Brian Battle versus Ange Lusa. I'm picking Brian Battle to go out there and win against Lusa. I do think he'll have a hard first round because Lusa is a physical specimen. And he's a force, man. He comes out hard. He's got good straight shots, backs opponents up well, finds good takedowns, and he's strong as hell, too. Do you think he slows a bit in the second and third? Brian Battle's got a length advantage, and I think he's the better grappler of the two. Though I think Luce is the physically stronger guy, as the fatigue sets in with the fight, I predict that Ange Luce slows down and Brian Battle submits him in the second or third round. I like later stage submission win for Brian Battle in this fight, Finch, man. Brian Battle submission. I think a choke is in the books here. Brian Battle's been looking better. He's good in that green zone, but he's also good when you grapple him. So I like him in those areas. He's getting more dangerous as he gets experience. Brian Battle was a guy early on who I thought, man, this guy's too passive. This guy's too loose. He doesn't have it. And then, you know, along the way, he was really able to make some turns. That head kick knockout he got really opened my eyes. And, you know, he's been able to collect some wins. So let's go with Brian Battle in this matchup. I I think he wins on the outside. I think he wins in the grappling as well. He ends up getting a finish. Makes sense to me. Brian Battle for the W is my call. 
Brian Battle for the W is Finchman's call. I'm seeing odds around the minus 170 range for Brian Battle with Angelusa as a plus 145 underdog. Now, Brian Battle to get it done by submission is my official pick. That sits all the way up at plus 550, and that surprises me because of Brian Battle's tricky grappling game. He's a plus 550 for sub. That doesn't make much sense to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's interesting. So you're you're gonna you're gonna touch sub sub. I, like I don't sub. know. I'm not money lines quality though, and I could see him going distance with Lusa because Lusa's strong as fuck. It's just I think that he's capable to win by submission, man. He definitely is, and and that's my pick as well. But just because it's my pick doesn't mean it's my bet, right? It's like right. you know, I think Brian Battle being in a parlay would make sense. Brian Battle in a parlay. Little hint. From Finch, man, that uh, I don't you know. Guys, Stay tuned. I don't know. We'll see. see we'll it. see if we see some battle in the parlay. I didn't. I didn't say all that, but I'm saying if you did, hi hypothetically, if you did throw him in a parlay, that wouldn't be crazy. Let's go. Let's go, Finch. Co-main event looking good. Brian Battle, the pick for us both. We got to jump to our main event of the evening. If you guys haven't yet, make sure you smash the likes. If you're new, subscribe. It's Money Line Monday. Actually, right now it's Tuesday by me. It's 12.28 a.m., so it just shifted to Tuesday while we were live. But Monday, 11 p.m. Eastern time and uh, 8 p.m. Pacific. I know I got to change the graphic eventually because the wrong time is still on. But I changed it on the thumbnail. Tai to Ivasa. Oh, I did. Oh, I did. Shit. Yeah, what the Tied fuck? It's been like that that long? Yeah. Oh, shit. AJ, yeah. how have I never read our graphic? See, I don't notice shit. My mom, like when I was a kid, my mom would ask me, didn't you see the trash? You had to yeah. walk right past it to go to school. Yeah. I'm like, mom, I didn't see the trash. You know what I'm I saying? I just don't I notice that. shit like that. Sorry, folks. That's funny as hell. Tai Tuivasa versus Marshin Tibura. Clash of styles, right? Tuivasa is a dangerous striker with serious knockout power, nasty low kicks, the ability to bang, and also a great chin. Tabura, a guy who absorbs significant amounts of damage, but then is able to weather storms and find wins by sub. He's a Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt. He's definitely the grappling side in this matchup. I'm going with Ty to get the win by knockout. I see his power being to the level enough so where he can hurt Tybura and not let him off the hook. Lesser guys have. Greg Hardy had Tybura rocked, and obviously we saw Tuivasa dispatch of Greg Hardy in one punch. Walt Harris had Tybura rocked. And then we saw, you know, Tibera take the heat back and put it on and do his thing with uh, Walt Harris on the ground. I don't think Tuivasa makes those same mistakes. I think when he has you hurt, he's got the power to put you out. There's a different power with him. He's a higher tier heavy puncher. We've seen Tibera knocked out a handful of times. And I think Tuivasa's adding to that list of knockout losses. Tai Tuivasa bounces back here. This is a matchup that Tai should thrive in. Tai Tuivasa wants somebody who's going to exchange with him. Now, Marcin Tibor will surely look for a takedown, but he will also engage in the striking when he misses those takedowns, and it's a great opportunity for Tai Tuivasa to bounce back. We've seen him in some tough scraps. I think Tai Tuivasa was a little overrated at one point, came back down to earth, and now people are going to find out again that the guy can definitely bang with the heavyweights you know he has a very very powerful puncher tied to avasa by knockout makes perfect sense the odds for this fight have tied to ivasa at just minus 125 tibura at plus 105 i think the reason for the odds being this close is to ivasa's three fight losing streak and the fact that he's been out grappled before it's just i don't think tibura can strike with them at all and he doesn't have the wrestling to take Tuivasa down with relative ease early in the fight. He's going to have to deal with Tuivasa in the striking department for a decent amount of time and then put a takedown on him. I don't think he can deal with that pummeling, man. I think Tiberius is getting slept. I like knockout win for Bam Bam Tuivasa that sits at minus 115. You might as well just money line. Well, somehow he wins by a fucking DQ and then you're kicking yourself. 10 more points for that. I'd rather go 25 money line. I mean, remember when people were picking Tuivasa over Cyril Ghan? It's like Tuivasa mm. got some big credit. So this is such a bad matchup for Marcin Tybura. Tybura is right. going to have trouble taking a not very, you know, tall, lanky guy. It's like hard to get to him. He's going to have underhooks, be able to get off that fence. Yeah, I think he's going to be able to keep it a striking fight and be able to knock him out. So that is a touchable line. It is a very touchable line, man. I like that line a lot. I'm hyped for it. 
Revenge Fight Club says, what a shit fight card, boys. Listen, I don't think it's a shit fight card. I think that following UFC 299, you're having a bit of, you know, the uh, post-lit event blues. 299 was stacked. I mean, what would you rather have as a fight night headliner? Would you have Tuivasa versus Tybura? Or would you rather have a Curtis Blades versus Jailton Almeida? I think Blades Almeida is a much bigger fight. And what was it, first or second fight of the night? It was a feature prelim. I think that was a was... prelim. Holy shit. That's yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah. It's like even the prelims of the pay-per-view are superior to some of these fight nights. So it just seems to be the way they want to do it. They overstack the prelims. Um, you know, that's the UFC's way of matchmaking to be able to really, really sell high ticket value, really get a lot of buzz around these pay-per-views. So you might be upset now, but then by the time the pay-per-view rolls around, you're like, this is a sick card. There's only so many fights to make. They got to spread them out how they want to spread them out strategically folks they're running a business here you know dana white was just saying miami was just you know making as much money as much and as much buzz as being at madison square garden that's how well this last card did it's because they can save these big fights for the pay-per-views folks yeah you're right you're right this was initially supposed to be on ufc 298 but it got rebooked to a fight night main event here because they needed a decent main event personally I think Tuivasa Tibur is going to be a way better fight than JL Tenno made of Curtis Blades, stylistically speaking. And I'm hyped for it. Tuivasa to bounce back. He's on a tough three fight losing streak. Volkov subbed him. He lost by knockout to Pavlovich. And prior to that, he knocked out, he got knocked out rather by Cyril Ghan in an absolute war, but he knocked him down. Tibur on the other front, brutally knocked out by Tom Aspinall. Fight before that, he got a decision over Blagoy Ivanov. I mean. So yeah, we're we're going we're going to Avasa heavy, Avasa. folks. It's True. I'm almost wanting to add it because it wasn't in my parlor locks. I didn't quite realize, you know, I mean, I don't look at odds. I didn't yeah. quite realize the odds would be that tight. So right. interesting. Why are they? Let's let let me ask it in the reverse. Why are they giving Tybura love? They think Tybura is going to take this motherfucker down and sub him. If you look though at the history of like certain guys, right, that absorb numerous amounts of damage and then come back. Right. Maybe there's a, I don't, I don't know. This is not me actually saying there's a actual statistic on this, but maybe there's a higher propensity of him coming back washed. Like three brutal losses in a row where he absorbed damage. Fighting True. Tibura, who's like a staple gatekeeper. Nonetheless, I think it's a mistake. I think that Tibura is getting chinned in a big shot. Yeah. I mean, you're talking about Cyril yeah. Gan, Sergey Pavlovich, and Alexander Volkov. These right. are the, you know, one, two, three best strikers. And, um, you know, that was an Ezekiel choke against Volkov, but he's had a little bit of time. I mean, we're talking September of last year. I think he's going to come back recharged, good energy. And, uh, Marcin Tybura is in trouble. Of course, Marcin Tybura's losses are to Volkov and Aspinall as well. But, uh, Blagoy Ivanov, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I, I feel like Tybura is, a level or two below to Ivasa and he'll have to, you know, hope on a, a takedown or some type of lucky punch as to where to Ivasa underhooks, get off that fence, let his hands go. I see him knocking Tybor out early, buddy. Can I say something though? It's interesting. Two relevant opponents to mention. Sergey Spivak lost to Marcin Tibur and he absolutely destroyed Tai Tuivasa on the ground. Yep. Blagoy Ivanov won a gritty decision over Tai Tuivasa and Marcin Tibur was able to beat him. Now, granted, MMA math is not what I'm using here, but I guess the reason for the odds being close is when you look at previous opponents and results, like Tibur has done well against guys that Tuivasa struggled with. Granted, was some time ago, not the same uh, Tuivasa necessarily, but I guess that's why the odds, I'm assuming, are on the closer side. Josiah Lopez thinks he's more baked than you. Did we get Probably. to the light? I didn't, did I didn't get a real play a saxophone. No, no oh, I just got it. 70 likes. I didn't think I was going to get it. Listen, <laughs> guys, I've been practicing music for a very long time. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm going to give you guys what you want. Here is uh, a beautiful song. And the name of it is. Uh, parlay time. Can you play parlay time on parlay the saxophone? Time? Damn, you know what? I'm forgetting the name of the song that I was going to say. I never wanted. What is that song? Dance Again. What's that song? Yeah. That one? Am I, am I, am I don't I know the name, it? bro. I don't know the name. Know Listen. Name. Uh, help us out, chat. What's the name of that song? CBD Lion Time. Let's go. Dun, 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 dun. 
the way I am with you. I'm like messing up these lyrics. This is terrible. I'll sing Careless for you guys whisper. in a second. Careless Whisper. That's his song. <coughs> Careless what is Whisper. That, Finch? What are you bringing up right now? Hit, hit the fucking... Hit the next segment and we'll do it. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. Wait, we got more segments? Holy shit. Next <laughs> segment. <laughs> Lock of the night, baby. If you followed the Finch Man and I last week, we crushed it on the locks. Finch Man with Sugar Sean, me with Piotr Jan, Peter Pan. Come on. Off. Let's go, baby. Come on. Finch, man, I think you have something crazy this week. I don't know. I got a feeling. I mean, crazy. I don't know if it's crazy or not. But first of all, I have to. All right. Isaac Delgarian being at those odds, that really surprised me, guys. I was going to try to lock up Gerald Mearshart's sub and go out on a limb and give you guys plus money and finally do a pick where I'm putting a finish in as the lock, which I never do. I'm Mr. Moneyline. But Isaac Delgarian, you're getting good odds, even odds. Come on, man. I like Christian Rodriguez a lot. He's a better striker, but he's going to have a lot of trouble in this matchup up at 145 against a stronger guy who's a finisher who I think he's just going to be holding off. So give me Isaac Delgarian with fairly confident lock of the night. And before AJ goes, I believe AJ's lock is Isaac Delgarian too, isn't it? Finchman called and I'm locking Delgarian there with him. We're on the same side. I'm confident for sure in some other picks, but you guys know what the lock, something that I look to do, and unless I'm in a chalky mood, is I look for – a decent line, something that I see has a likelihood of happening where the odds percentage wise are lower than that. And I think that Dolgarian, how I see it in my head, is a three to one favorite, and you have him in the minus 170 range. So we're going with Dolgarian. I think that he pulls this off. I believe that he has a significant grappling advantage. Do not doubt him in the stand up. And the truth of the matter be told, I think Christian Rodriguez gets bodied when they tie up. Dolgarian, lock of the week for both Finchman and I both. Let's fucking go, my man. That's the Let's, lock segment. Let's go. I like it, man. Look, the train keeps on a rolling. Keeps on rolling. Um, yeah, it's it's a fun one. It's a fun one, but I feel like it's like, you know, what you see all those Anthony Pettis fights where he's just kind of holding the guy off. They're bringing too yeah. much pressure. I think Dolgarian's going to walk forward on this one, man. Let's go. Listen, Finchman and I both doubling down on the Dolgarian lock, but we're not done just yet. Parlay time. All the competition that try to compete. Stand back. Watch the bomb drop. Parlay time. Open up your wallets and let's bet on some fist fights. Uh, uh, it's, it's parlay time. Welcome to Moneyline. We're gonna give you a parlay tonight. Ooh. And it's Gerald Mearshart. He's gonna get the sub. Gerald Mearshart. He's gonna get the sub. Brian Barbarena can't defend a choke to save his life come on son gerald mearshart you don't even have to put him as submission though because you're gonna get good money on gerald mearshart money line tiago moises money line tiago moises is taking on ramirez a short notice ramirez and you're gonna get gerald mearshart the best choke artist in the division against the guy with the worst submission defense in the division Come on, son. Gerald Mearshart money line. Tiago Moises money line. That's the parlay. Mike Finch at minus 116 with that parlay, which I think is honestly a great line for something as likely as that. I see it coming home. I see Finch man getting his hand raised with the lock this week. Now, for me, I think Kennedy and Zetchaku is essentially a lock here. If he somehow loses to OSP, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring out the retirement card for him. We'll go double retirement on the night. OSP going off and winning, and Zetchaku, we're sending him to uh, I don't know to like Octagon. We're sending him to fucking to Eastern Europe to go fight some guys over there. I don't think he's losing, and Zetchaku's pulling this one out. Now, as far as the next addition to it, I really have high confidence on Mike Davis, man. I think he's got a great chance to win, but the odds of that are not necessarily juicy enough because it's minus 165. So I am going to put Brian Battle on my slate as well. 
We're going plus 161. Battle Mike Davis and Zetchaku for the dubs. Looking forward to it. Let's go, baby. Let's go. I, I like this lock. I like this parlay. I know you guys are all excited about pay-per-views. I heard somebody shit on this card, but it's not always about what the card's main event is, right? When you're looking to bet, it's all about finding the right bets at the right odds. I feel like the ones me and AJ just read off to you are pretty high confidence. I'll be touching them. Remember to bet responsibly. You got to make the decision. Don't let us tell you who to bet for. You got to make that decision. But I'm telling you. I like the ones we just read off. Let's go. Let's go, Finch, man. Listen, we're not done just yet, guys, because there was a fight this past Friday right. that happened in boxing, and it saw right. the lineal MMA heavyweight champion, former UFC heavyweight champion, Francis Ngannou, take on high-tiered boxer Anthony Joshua. Now, you all probably know the result, but let's first say something. Francis Ngannou gave Tyson Fury one of the hardest fights, if not the hardest fight of his entire boxing career, and he put him on the canvas. He then took on Anthony Joshua, who's a skilled puncher and boxer, and he got absolutely destroyed in two rounds. He got dropped in the first, dropped twice in the second, and flatline KO'd as well. It was vicious, man. And I'll be honest, I was worried for Francis after they giving him oxygen. That type of loss can change a fighter. He's never been knocked out as a pro, and now... Even going back to MMA, there's a potential for Francis Ngannou to be a bit more gun shy. Not saying that's necessarily the case, but I have to be a little worried. Francis being in his later 30s and viciously knocked out in that matter. Props to Anthony Joshua because he dispatched to Francis Ngannou how many boxing pundits anticipated Tyson Fury too, right? Like people thought Fury would dominate. Maybe not as quickly, but people thought Fury would knock him out. I picked Fury in that fight. Joshua punished him and uh, yeah, gold medalist in boxing and a huge human being. It's sensible that that happens. This is what we expected, but the KO was really the part that was surprising. I could not believe how Francis couldn't get out of the way of that right hand at all. And it was scary while I was watching the fight. So while I was watching that action go down, we have Francis oxygen. They didn't need to give him oxygen. Okay. He didn't need the oxygen folks. He, he, he can breathe the carbon dioxide oxygen mix in the air. Okay. He doesn't need straight oxygen. Francis Ngannou did not have near the defense that he needed to against an AJ. AJ was able to let a straight right hand go with some decent timing, relatively unset up. He literally just had to slam the two down the pipe, which is, it, it really highlights how amateurish the overall boxing game of Francis is. And it really highlights the fact that Francis had developed this boxing style where he's like pacing himself for 10 rounds. I think that was the wrong move against AJ. It was the, it ended up being the right move against Tyson Fury. Cause we got like an immobile fat Tyson Fury who fought just a little differently, just like, like objectively look at him fight Tommy Schwartz. He's moving his head. He's rolling with shots. Look at him fight. He's like back to like English style boxing, just kind of standing yeah. you against right. it was strange. I think the size of Francis has a lot to do with that, but AJ also being this ridiculous physical freak, they're standing in front of each other. AJ's not really getting bullied, and he's able to just box with Francis. Then it's AJ all day because, like you said, Olympic experience, former heavyweight champion. You know, he's fought all the best in the world, most of the best in the world, and um, he was just able to slam a right hand in there uncontested. Like the best way to say it is uncontested. When you're throwing your right hand, you got to worry about being countered with a slip left hook. You got to be worried about countered to the body. You got to be worried about being countered with an uppercut, with another straight cross, somebody slipping on you. Francis didn't offer any of that. He just left that hand out there for show. It was for show. There was no consequence. If we could rewind the clock and you could tell Francis, bro, this is a two-round fight, go crazy. He would be far more in the fight. I think that AJ never wanted to fight Deontay Wilder because Deontay can make you pay when you do something like let right hands go. Francis has that ability, but he's in there trying to like box. It's just really was not the move against AJ. Obviously, this AJ and I were both on it, and we both said stoppage as well on the last show, but um, the way the stoppage happened was scary. After the face-off, I said, fuck it, I'm going with the MMA community, pick flip, and Ganu for the right. win. 
didn't. <laughs> no, you didn't. Dude, I had to support him, man. I took the L. I was I wasn't betting it though. I don't I don't know if you know if I really believe that I, I, I would told folks it. bet AJ. Like I didn't yeah, bet on it either, thought. you know? But I told folks I said bet AJ. I don't care what the line is, bet AJ. So I didn't flip. I'm not flipping on you folks. All the right. Who talked AJ crazy. into this? Who who is the degenerate who talked this upstanding man, AJ DeVito, into voting against his his AJ brethren? Okay. Come on. Listen, Francis Ngannou, Deontay Wilder still interests me. Yeah, because of where Deontay is in his career, because right. Deontay's not that big of a heavyweight. Right. Yes, that fight does make sense. I think we it should always did. It. it always did. That should be next. I think it should be Francis Ngannou versus Wilder in boxing, or even Francis Ngannou Wilder in modified MMA. Like, I'm down for any of it. I know he has Henan Ferreira, but... Let's be honest, bro. You're fighting a superstar, in all honesty, as far as boxing goes, and Anthony Joshua. No diss on Henan Ferreira. He's a good PFL champion, but he's a PFL champion that isn't well known to the masses. Now, I know that fight's scheduled, you know, tentatively for, I believe, next December. But I think Henan Ferreira gives him a run for his money, he no? He could. He could knock him out. He's got heavy hands. Bro, Henan Ferreira is real. Why is he risking it against Henan Ferreira for significantly less when we can set up the Wilder fight? I think Wilder looked at that Joshua fight and maybe said, okay, we can put this guy out. That's a fight. I, I always said that was the fight, you know? Yeah. yeah, especially if Francis came back right away. Like, you know, Wilder lost some of his shine, some of his buzz after the last loss. And now Francis obviously loses quite a bit of stock. So it's like a smaller fight now. It still is a big fight. It still is worth fight. making. But imagine if you made that fight last year. It's a big fight and, big and fight, a winnable yeah. one for Francis. So yeah. um, it's too bad it wasn't Wilder versus Francis instead of Francis versus AJ. Um, the right fight after Tyson Fury would have been Wilder. It would have been. It is what it is. They chose to keep him, you know, towards the elite level. He I think walked Anthony into Joshua. the trap. They set he this did. trap for him, yeah. and Francis stepped right in it. But you know what? $20 million sounds pretty nice. I mean, but would he, what what is he going to make against Wilder? Maybe a 12. Lot. 12, oh, bro, yeah. before Wilder just lost the last one, yeah, I'd say same price. I'd say same price and a much more winnable fight. What yeah. did he get in, a, get in a rematch against Tyson Fury? You know Tyson wants the rematch. Now yeah. it's not as sexy. Now it's not as good. You know. So you think they still would do the if Fury loses to Usyk, that rematch could still be on the table. No, they have to do an instant rematch, and yeah, I know right. this. Because I looked at the fucking contract. Oh, I shit. know that and I didn't look at the actual contract. That's okay. bullshit. But I, right. I know the contract says that it's an instant rematch. No matter oh, what shit. happens, Fury Usyk, they have to run it back. Okay. Okay. So yeah, I think Francis Ngannou is he's either going back to MMA and hopefully he wins against Henan Ferreira. I just feel good about builds. telling AJ something about boxing. He didn't know. I, know. I love I didn't that know. moment because I feel I like know. AJ's more of a boxing guy than me. So I'm just gonna I'm gonna relish this I think you moment might right here. I'm more of a sport fan of boxing, like as far as the actual sport, right on a, on a level of just it. But as I far just pretty as, much like, like the heavyweight division, dude. I'm, I'm a heavyweight boxing fan too, bro. Like yeah. that's I always since I was young. I like paying attention to heavyweight, specifically when Wilder emerged. But I was. Not big into the Klitschko era, man. I just, even though he got nice knockouts, I don't know. It just wasn't the style, man. Chad Moody, BTO in the chat says, Kennedy is a bigger lock this week than in 1960 against Nixon. That's just, okay. that's a solid comment, bro. I that's just thought. Good. I wish that I had, I wish I would have saw it. I didn't say I it. I just, you know, I had to, Shout out to I him. had to bring that one up because you kind of killed it with that. Thank you. Yeah. That was nice. That was 10 out of 10. I actually followed the Richard Nixon Foundation on, on, on YouTube now. Some good content, dude. I, yeah. You know, Richard Nixon, Nixon always bodied by the whole Watergate thing, which, like, deservedly so. You know, can't yeah. be doing that shit. But, uh, you know, he's grown on me a little bit more. I didn't, really? I didn't quite respect him. And uh, if you dig in, Richard Nixon's uh, kind of smart. All right. Well, Richard Nixon, president, 2028. We'll bring him mm -hmm. back as just a head. Mm -mm. Just ahead. We'll bring him back as a head. Like you see Futurama when they have Richard Nixon, right? Re Reemerge, reanimate him. And in we'll in him Futurama, Richard Nixon comes back? Yeah. But he's he's just ahead though. He's like in like a water thing. Yeah. It's pretty funny. Yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna swipe left on that one. All right. 
All right. Maybe in 3024, we'll be talking different. Yeah. You know, hey, uh, let me say this. Let me put this one out there on the Internet. If I go, I want you guys to bring me back. Okay, Okay. bring me. Keep me alive. Okay. (laughs) if you figure out how to bring me back, I don't care as long as I'm not in like excruciating pain or trapped as a prisoner or something. Bring me back. Put me in the cyborg body. You know, download my consciousness, whatever you need to do, 2030, 4030, whatever the year is, bring me back. I want to return. All right. Mike Finch, he's coming back as head in uh, the jar. I think he's coming back as cyborg, and I'm excited for him. So cyborg Finch coming. I mean, you look like a cyborg earlier. I don't know. We were worried you might be AI. <laughs> if people were, were doubting you. Instinct real, RT man. says, let's clone Finch, Finch clone army. Yes. Holy shit. Make yeah. a clone army of me i'm in i will sign off on this all right let's go finch man much love finch much love chat i hope you guys enjoyed this week's show next week i'm gonna be chopping it up with finch man from the road so that should be pretty fun but yeah shows don't stop every single monday every single money line we break down the cards and we keep bringing the heat thank you finch man thank you people smash the likes any final words finch before we send them off I mean, I got a lot of crazy questions in the chat, but yes, uh, you could bring me back in anybody's body, whatever. You know, the most the most valuable thing to me and hopefully to all of us is this consciousness, this life, this experience, right? You want to be here, you know? I'm not a religious person, so after this, I'm not really like looking toward... I think yeah. this is heaven, right? Look around the cosmos, okay? Look at Mars. Look at these other planets. This is heaven. We live on this blue ball with this atmosphere, with these oceans. I, I think that this is it so i want to keep the party going keep me around i know that has nothing to do with mma look i think ufc 299 was fantastic i think that 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 francis and ganu knockout was crazy so what a week for combat sports let's keep it rolling with cash and some solid bets this weekend good luck everybody peace out guys have a fantastic night and we'll see you all in the next one